How's that for a slice of fried gold? Are you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be mad. There's a fresh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticky paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a time of one good scare. Well, hello, and welcome to Cinema Shock, a podcast exploring the stories behind your favorite cult and genre films. I'm your co-host, Gary Horn. Hey, I'm co-host Justin Bishop, and we're joined today by writer-comedian, Mr. Todd A. Davis. Hey, everybody. Welcome back, Todd. It's been so long. (laughs) I know. Thanks for having me back, guys. (laughs) Uh, We actually did skip a week in our recording schedule this week, but hopefully you didn't realize that. Because we got this episode out on time. Yeah, yeah that's my fault. <laughs> I'm speaking that into power. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah. Speak it into power. I yes. think we can do uh, so it. So visualize it, up. speak yeah. it into being. That's right. That's like that book, The Secret. I think that's what that's about, right? Getting podcasts out on time. I think, uh, exactly I think so. It. That's why it was so popular. <laughs> yeah. So, so last week we wrapped up the first part of our Toby Hooper series. We're going to revisit Toby Hooper in a few weeks, but... Uh, As we mentioned last week, we're going to take a little bit of a detour to discuss a man by the name of Dan O'Bannon. And the reason that we're doing that will become clear down the line because him and Toby Hooper, they do cross paths. Uh, The thing about Dan Dan O'Bannon, though, is that he he crossed paths with a lot of people. (laughs) So we could really kind of integrate his story into a lot of different filmmakers' stories. But we think that with Toby Hooper, it it makes kind of the most sense. And as we get into his story over the next few weeks, you'll kind of see why we think that. Um, We've seen that. We've seen a lot of crossovers already with like George Romero and and Tom. Yeah. That's the great thing about telling the story of these, you know, these, these filmmakers is that you do see a lot of interaction and crossover. Uh, You, you kind of, the, the further we go into it, you start to see kind of the, the branches of the family tree, you know, of mm. genre filmmaking. A lot of times it's completely unplanned. Like we just start researching and realize, oh, this person already worked with George Romero or, you know, it's it's really kind of cool. And But this time with Dan O'Bannon, we did it kind of deliberately because uh, mm. I've always been a big fan of his story. And I've always thought that like it would be a fun one to tell because of his connections. Now, if if you don't know the name Dan O'Bannon, I wouldn't necessarily blame you. He's not like a household name. He's not as well known as someone like George Romero or Toby Hooper or Tom Savini or any of the other people that we've talked about. If you do know who he is or you do, that name does ring a bell, you probably know him as the writer of Ridley Scott's Alien or as the director of Return of the Living Dead. And those are probably his biggest contributions to the world of genre cinema, but he's been involved with more legendary franchises and filmmakers than you probably realize. This is a guy who he has worked in genres of science fiction, horror, action, animation. Uh, He's worked with the likes of John Carpenter, Ridley Scott, George Lucas, Paul Verhoeven. There's a very good chance that even though you may not know it, that O'Bannon is, is at least partially responsible for one of your favorite movies. But the guy, he never really gets the credit. And that's the thing with Dan O'Bannon. That's, uh, he's, like I said, he's not a household name because he, he's never really been put on the pedestal that some of these other quote unquote masters of horror have. Even the, and maybe it's because he didn't stick to one genre. You know, maybe he's not like a horror movie guy necessarily, not like a horror movie filmmaker like someone like John Carpenter or, or Toby Hooper might have been pigeonholed as. And just like we did, you know, in our series on Toby Hooper, we called that one the tragedy of Toby Hooper. We could very easily call this the tragedy of Dan O'Bannon because like Hooper, he was never really given the respect in Hollywood that he might have deserved, despite the fact that he helped to create films and usher in careers that have made literally billions of dollars. Well, he seems like the guy behind the guy. He seems like one of those type of... uh... Yeah, I mean, he does. He is the guy behind the guy, but he also deserves to be seen as a little bit more than that, I think. Mm. Uh, So why, why did his career, you know, never really take off the way that maybe it should have? That's a that's something we're going to be discussing over the next few weeks. But first, we have to go back to the beginning with a film that helped that he helped to create while he was still a student at the the University of Southern California, 
which is 1974's Dark Star. It is the future. Mankind has conquered the stars. He moves out to the endless interstellar reaches of the universe. An advanced exploration corps, a new breed of pioneer must seek out unstable planets and destroy them. You are on the mission of the 21st century planet smashers. Dark Star. 20 years in space, 1 million light years from Earth, their job is to clear a path for the colonization of space. Back home, back home in Malibu. I used to surf a lot, Talby. I used to be a great surfer. Travel in an infinite universe with mind-melting excitement from beyond the stars. Commander Powell. Commander Powell, this is Doolittle. Can you hear me? Man, what happened, man? Hey. Confirmed. Power drive sequence activated. Roger retracted. Lock all defensive systems. Dark Star. They are not lost in space. They are loose. So Dan O'Bannon was born in St. Louis, Missouri in uh, 1946. It didn't take long for him to become a lifelong fan of genre films. A viewing of Howard Hawks' The Thing at age five was all that it took. It terrified him <laughs> as a five-year-old. And he was hooked. He was a genre fan. He was a sci-fi fan. He was a horror fan for the rest of his life after that viewing, uh, much like John Carpenter. Is uh, is that version of the thing, uh, you know, as shocking as John Carpenter's? I mean, for the time? Um, maybe for the time. Yeah. As, as okay. viewer, it's a lot more goofy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot more uh, goofy. Right. It's, I think it's still a very good movie. I think, I think it's really the thing from another world is the full name of it. I think it's a very good movie, but it's, less i mean john carpenter's is apocalyptic you know and it is not it the and the the alien's not really it's not a shapeshifter in that one oh okay. it's more of a um Sword giant vegetable oh <laughs> okay <laughs> i mean literally it's like a it's a humanoid but it's vegetable based we'll probably get into a good long discussion on the howard hawks thing down the line when we discuss john carpenter's i think that would make a pretty good discussion nice uh, but throughout his childhood dan o'bannon you know reading sci-fi stories and watching fantasy films became a regular pastime for him uh, but he didn't immediately know that he wanted to be a filmmaker he played around with you know an eight millimeter camera in high school making these little short films and stuff but it never seemed to really occur to him that this was like a, an actual career that he could explore but when he went to college this kind of continued he he didn't really know what he wanted to do but this idea of filmmaking was always kind of in the back of his mind he bounced around to four different colleges during that time. He changed his major constantly. Uh, first, he went to art school in Washington, at, or excuse me, at Washington University, which is there in St. Louis where he grew up. And while going to Washington University, he was doing stand-up comedy routines. He did makeup for theater productions there on campus. He provided illustrations for the student newspaper. He did everything. Like Even early on in his career, O'Bannon was kind of a jack-of-all-trades. Nice. And while attending Washington University, his roommate there was a guy by the name of Michael Schamberg, who would go on to be a very powerful movie producer. He did, he produced movies like A Fish Called Wanda, Reality Bites, Pulp Fiction, Aaron Brockovich. He's actually part of Jersey Films with Danny DeVito, who's produced quite a lot of Tarantino's work. Oh, nice. So he would later transfer to uh, Florissant Valley Junior College in Ferguson, Missouri. And it was there that he made kind of his first quote unquote real short film uh, as, as opposed to the stuff he was just making like as a kid he directed a short science fiction satire called the attack of the 50 foot chicken uh-huh. i tried to find it online i could only find clips of it i was about to say i could only ever find clips i really wanted to find it now i will say so for some gumption for the guy he apparently petitioned the school to buy him the camera that he used to shoot this thing so oh yeah uh, not the chicken but the the actual film itself but the <laughs> but and i say that because the only clip i could really find of it was a guy that it was like five minutes of a party <coughs> dude lining up a shot to shoot a giant chicken i mean it wasn't you know the chicken was not near anything to like give it size you know you just had to guess that it was a giant you had to pretend that it was 50 feet tall (laughs) right (laughs) suspend your disbelief right yeah (laughs) so according to dan o'bannon he was reading an issue of playboy magazine 
Mm -hmm. uh, and he says that he's like, I'd already, you know, worked my way through all the, I'd already enjoyed the centerfolds in Playboy <laughs> and uh, several times. So I was looking for things to read. So he's, he was actually reading Playboy for the articles. <laughs> A likely and story. It, it, it was, well, he, he admits that he wasn't initially reading it for the articles, but he's like, eh, I got all the enjoyment I could out of the centerfolds and stuff. So then I just started reading it. And it, he found an article that discussed the best film schools in the country, which led him to apply at the University of Southern California. And it's funny because despite his involvement in the arts, you know, working in theater and illustration and all this stuff, he was actually pursuing a psychology degree at the, uh, degree at the time that he applied to USC's film school because wow. he, he like had a revelation. He's like suddenly thought, he's like, wait a minute, I don't want to be a psychologist. So <laughs> after doing some soul searching, he decided he would go on to try to be a filmmaker, this thing that he'd always enjoyed, but never really saw as a career. He's like, you know, what the hell, let's go for it. So he got accepted to USC and he described that experience as lonely and frustrating, mm. but it was there at USC that he met his future collaborator, a man by the name of John Carpenter. Now, listen, I know I just, I've, I've got to say this up front because y'all know me and y'all know I want to talk about John Carpenter, but I'm going to try to restrain myself a little bit here because I love him so much. And no. JC is Bay. Uh, that said, I'll just say this, <laughs> uh, He's not coming from a dissimilar background. Uh, this is no. a story more about Dan O'Bannon, but small town in Kentucky, that sort of thing. His buddy, Tommy Lee Wallace, who we're, we'll talk about, I'm sure, because he works on this film, uh, is who got him over to USC. They'd known each other since they were kids. Wallace uh, and him became friends and they're like really good friends in their teens. You know, hear Tommy Lee Wallace talk about him. John Carpenter was basically a prodigy. He was constantly writing music, writing little novels, making films. It was a mission for him to just create art artistically. And uh, to hear Wallace describe it, by the time he was looking at college, he already just knew so much about making movies. He just didn't know how to finish it. Like how yeah. to, as the great philosopher Larry the Cable Guy would say, he didn't know how to get her done. You know, <laughs> so like he knew how to work everything. He just didn't know what to do from there. And Wallace yeah. started telling him about, like, maybe you should go to school for it. I just saw some stories with Tommy Lee Wallace saying that he basically just handed him the college blue book, which is like lists all of the institutes of higher learning and Carpenter immediately found UCLA and USC and decided he had to get to one of those. And he finally landed on USC because maybe it just, I don't know, had the better rep for what he was trying to achieve. So, yeah. So, and I know Gary is probably dying to like talk a lot about John Carpenter's background, but like he said, this is a series on Dan O'Bannon. And while we will be discussing John Carpenter pretty extensively on this episode, uh, you know us and you know, we're going to do a John Carpenter series down the line. So there you will be to. plenty of time <laughs> to talk about John Carpenter and his childhood and his upbringing and his career. So if you're wondering why we don't get further into that during this, I mean, that's why basically. Yeah, yeah. All so in I just, good time. I was, all I was good, trying to set myself up. time, dear listeners. I was trying to let you all know, too, that I was not going to ramble about John Carpenter at some point during this episode <laughs> about how great I is and his life story. I just, I was just getting him to the same place as Dan O'Bannon. Hey, yeah. So it's important to keep in mind that in the late 1960s, film school wasn't really a thing. We hear about it now and people go into film school, you know, and it, that wasn't really a thing back then. Prior to this, most of the filmmaking that USC's quote unquote film school was teaching was to train cameramen for the military. It wasn't like filmmaking techniques and things like that. And all that changed when a new group of filmmakers, guys like George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma, collectively known as the movie brats because they were kind of the first generation to come out of true film school. Mm. They began to go to school to learn technique to make dramatic films, not just, you know, shooting war footage. It's funny to me because somehow because of the BS we've all had to endure through the Star Wars prequels that uh, when I was reading stuff about this, I mean, the two names you'd see over and over again were for legends for film students were George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola. And uh, George Lucas was, I think, because he was out of USC, he was their legend guy. And yeah. UCLA, I think, was Coppola. So they were that was like their legend guy. So when you were looking to be a film student, you were like, do you want to go to the Lucas school or the Coppola school? Well, the thing with Lucas and, and 
we will probably touch on this more in depth down the line when we when we discuss him. We discussed it a little bit on our old show when we did the original Star Wars trilogy, but he wanted to be a like an experimental filmmaker. He considered himself an art an art filmmaker, and if you see his early stuff, uh, one of which we're about to discuss, you can kind of see that. I think Lucas kind of got swallowed by the monster that Star Wars became and ended up like a billionaire, but not necessarily creatively doing what he wanted to do. Well, because I always thought of, I always thought his baby was THX, like the company. Like I always saw him as more of like his thing that he was really well, was the tech he, side. He became very interested in the tech side. Yes, I don't, I don't know that that was originally his intention, but he was always kind of fascinated by that. Mm. Anyway, that's something we'll we'll have to discuss on a George Lucas series down the line. Yeah, but speaking of George Lucas. When, George, when, when John Carpenter first arrived at USC, he saw a short film called Electronic Labyrinth, THX 11384EB, uh, which is uh, rolls directed off by tongue. George Lucas. <laughs> it's something that he, yeah, just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Uh, it was something that George Lucas had made while he was a student there. And Lucas was soon developing his short into a feature length movie with the thankfully shortened title of simply THX 1138. But Carpenter saw that and he's like, I, this is how we do it. This is how I can get a movie made. Here's the thing with him. He's already thinking about how this could be transitioned into something bigger for him. Uh, yeah. But also not just school, a student film. Yeah. And also around this time, the school's learning a little bit about the business side of things. And I've got some stuff on that for, for in just a little bit, but I harp on this ep- every episode and Todd, you kind of mentioned it, just how much I love this uh, crossover that we see all of the time. So uh, this may be oversimplifying just a bit, but kids today, you have already learned how if it had not been for George Lucas, uh, Michael Myers and zombies that crave brains may never have existed. (laughs) It's very true. Very true. So another film that caught Carpenter's attention while he was there as a student was one called Bloodbath, another little short film made by a fellow student. This film, which features a sort of, I I haven't seen it. I've not seen Bloodbath. I'll admit that. I I believe it's on YouTube. I read a lot of, I read a lot about it. So the the description that I read describes it as sort of a melancholy. It's got this main character who's this sort of melancholy misanthrope going about his daily life. And then there's this like stream of consciousness narration over it. Like very, it sounds very bizarre, but, and you know, sounds very, very much like an angsty student made that. Sort yeah, of yeah. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. But, and the, the narration in the film, though, not the performance was done by the film's director, which was Dan O'Bannon. Oh. So they, they showed this, the audience enjoyed the film at first. Like it, it, it felt like a setup to a dark joke. That's how people who saw it described it. And uh, they liked it up to a certain point because the whole thing's playing like it's set up, you know, it's a short film and there's going to be this big exclamation point, this big punchline at the end. But instead of a punchline, the main character slits his wrists in a bathtub. <laughs> so people like this happens and the people in the audience are just silent or like uncomfortable or, or some of them got mad. Some of them got angry about it. One woman yelled, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> during, the, during the screening. No, if that's not uh, some like, edgelord the, goth shit. <laughs> <laughs> but John Carpenter loved it. So after the screening, he actually approached O'Bannon to let him know that, hey, I loved your short film. And O'Bannon was flattered. And he they got kind of got talking and he explained to Carpenter that the idea for this movie began with the idea that blood splattered on white tile could be a beautiful thing, a beautiful image. Uh, so you got to remember, O'Bannon started his college career as an art student. And as a former art student, for O'Bannon, horror first started with an image, like a single image in his mind, and then all the possibilities of that image. But side note for everyone listening, not a good way to introduce yourself to most people. Luckily, <laughs> luckily, John Carpenter you- buys right in. But this, <laughs> by the, this, by the way, is fucking Dan O'Bannon. He's a character. They all are. But this guy's a little out there. And it's not even just that he's he trying is. to impress you with his artsy or downer view on the world. He's also, from everything I can read about him, is testing you to see if he even wants to associate with you. Jack Harris, who's a producer we'll talk about later. Uh, we haven't got to him yet. But he even tells a story about the first time he met Dan O'Bannon that uh, Dan O'Bannon hands him a Polaroid and he looks at it and he can't quite make out the image. And he says, what is this? And Dan O'Bannon's like, it's an extraterrestrial. And he's like, (laughs) okay. And he's like, where'd you get this? He's like, I took it in the woods by my house. And 
<laughs> he's like, okay, <laughs> I don't know that I believe that. And Dan O'Bannon proceeds to explain to him that, well, no, not really. But my dad used to do this all the time and he would sell them and he taught me how to make them. And then Jack Harris tells him that doesn't seem like a very practical way to do business. And then <laughs> from that point on, Dan O'Bannon always hated Jack Harris. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, he hated Jack Harris for other reasons. That well, we'll yeah, it's not just on. that, but he's, he's Jack Harris tell that story. Jack Harris. <laughs> he says he hated him from there. And you could, it, it, any body you find that talks about Dan O'Bannon, including his own wife, says that he either loved you or he hated you. And there was yeah. no in between. <laughs> and he had a temper and he was cantankerous and, uh, and difficult. And, mm. and that doesn't discount how good he was at his job. He wasn't like, he wasn't abusive to anyone except not even verbally abusive. I think he was just kind of a, like, if he didn't like you, you just knew it. It wasn't like he would cuss you out. He just didn't adhere himself to you. You know, he, he like, just wouldn't he engage just, with you really. Yeah. Like he just wouldn't have anything to do with you. And if he liked you, he was like, <laughs> just like yeah. all over you to like <laughs> yeah. hang out with you. So once O'Bannon and Carpenter started talking, the two realized that they had a lot in common with each other, uh, a mutual love for Howard Hawks, a thing from another world, for example, but also as Gary kind of mentioned earlier, very similar backgrounds. So John Carpenter proposed that they make a movie together. And when they start planning this, John Carpenter, he, he's kind of modeling his low, his low budget sci-fi movie on that George Lucas film he'd seen, THX, THX 1138, because it had proven that you didn't need elaborate special effects or studio money to make science fiction. And the two, John Carpenter and O'Bannon, despite their kind of similar upbringings, they made a pretty odd couple personality wise because O'Bannon was very wound up and intense and sometimes, like I said, hard to handle. So Ter Terrence Winkless, who was a fellow student that O'Bannon had worked on on another short film and who works on this, said that when he first met O'Bannon, he walked into O'Bannon's room and he found a gun sitting on a stack of porn. <laughs> like that was his introduction to him. Like this is a guy like that's All just right. not something you see in 1960s, you know, Southern California. What? He'll uh, be at a red blooded American. <laughs> Listen, you haven't lived till you're spanking it to Playboy with a loaded weapon in your mouth. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's the only way to spank it to Playboy is with a loaded <laughs> weapon. In it's your the mouth. only way I can get off anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but O'Bannon, yeah, he, O'Bannon did like his guns. That was actually a, a fun fact about O'Bannon that I didn't realize before <laughs> researching this. Like he was actually a kind of a gun nut and he liked porn. He was into porn. Because uh, this is already the second um, <laughs> the second <laughs> reference we've had on this episode. Uh, so another time, though, with Winkless, uh, another story he tells is one time they went out to eat at a diner. And O'Bannon ordered coffee, a tea, and a Coca-Cola. <laughs> and when the waitress thought he was joking, because there's like, nobody's going to consume that much caffeine. He's got to be joking. So she didn't bring it all to him. And he, like, flew into a rage. And this is like Winkless. Winkless is telling the story. He's like, yeah, O'Bannon could kind of fly off the handle. You're like, he had a temper. But he's just he a very odd guy and very like tightly wound. Mm. Whereas Carpenter was kind of aloof and easygoing and quiet and gentle and like very just kind of chill. You know, I mean, Carpenter nowadays has sort of a reputation of being this cranky old man. But if you read any stories about him as a young filmmaker, like he was very much like this easygoing hippie, you know, long haired hippie type and very kind of just calm and quiet in his speech, you know, but polar opposite, basically, of Dan O'Bannon. But the dynamic worked. I mean, although their personalities were very different, they had a lot, like I said, they had a lot in common. Both of them felt like outsiders in their small conservative towns that they'd grown up with, O'Bannon in Missouri and Carpenter in Kentucky. And they had both at a young age found solace in monster movies. The thing that sounds fun about USC at this time is that they're all a bunch of hippies. They didn't, they didn't have any choice, but to interact with each other. Uh, like Justin mentioned before, uh, this was just getting fleshed out as a film school. So there yeah, wasn't, it like, wasn't so, so much like them teaching you film as them throwing you together with a bunch of other people who knew, who wanted to learn how to make movies and then giving you the equipment to do so. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. They they li they literally took these people and put them in a stable, um, like a literal stable. There was there they said that there was like horseback riding right across the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, so you're constantly working with other people on their projects. You're sitting around discussing film theory, etc. 
and you build like a real camaraderie with like everybody that you're working with. It sounds like a really cool environment, but you know, it was also thrown together. Like we said, I mean, the, the sound stage had mattresses on the wall and uh, they said, you'd like dream about like the clicking of the film canisters or whatever, like they're learning from like looking at little moviolas and uh, all these things are like constantly running in the background, but it was like their own little world. But also like you'd be there and actual like real life film experts would stop by. They said, uh, you know, one day just Hitchcock might show up. And, uh, and Roman Polanski wow. was a was a big one that stopped by and had a lot of influence on these guys. Jeez. Yeah. And they sent in everybody. This because- is right when I mean, this was late 60s. This was when Polanski had just made Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. Yeah. The thing I find interesting is, you know, him being a psych major. I wonder if we're going to get into if that influenced his writing, because it seems like from Dark Star, you know, there's there's some it touches on some heavy themes. I mean, yeah, maybe yeah. getting a little bit ahead, but, uh, you know, and him fitting in at film school and they all seem to find uh, these horror movies, which, you know, more often than not focus on, quote unquote, the other. And so they all probably felt that way. So they all had that yeah. immediate bond. I think everybody yeah, I mean, had like those different interests and like uh, I think O'Bannon even was like interested in like Lovecraft and stuff early on and oh, yeah. and he'll work on that stuff well, later. Carpenter too. Yeah, and Carpenter obviously. So Carpenter, yeah. the the cool part I was I was thinking about with the film school thing is that one thing you can count on with these guys though is because they're, they're all helping each other with each other's projects. You, you learn every single aspect of filmmaking. By you the time to. you leave there, you know your shit because you've done. Yeah that job at some point and but back to the the carpenter and o'bannon relationship and it was interesting to be sure like justin mentioned carpenter being more reserved he was opinionated but he was really laid back and o'bannon was (laughs) i was like running through my notes and i was like o'bannon was well known for being loud and you know what here here's the thing i'm just gonna write down every word i've heard so far to describe him in interviews i've watched so (laughs) here they are unusual angry a lot hard to miss extremely intense as a person had a cosmic outlook on life grim dismissive big voice big personality if he liked you he would really engage very funny loose cannon john was gentle dan on edge (laughs) that was that was like the description of grim Grim dismissal, yeah. Grim oh, yeah. dismissive was grim dismissive. The, the I think that's going to be the my my stage name in my my new goth band, my goth industrial <laughs> band. <laughs> right. uh, and and I think what attracted Carpenter too was uh, from from some stuff I was reading that Dark Star was going to be his grad project, and he initially approached Dan about acting in it, like he loved the personality, and that was his first idea. It, of course, naturally evolved. Um, because O'Bannon is just like this highly creative person that it started offering ideas and they became more and more uh, collaborative. Always at night, by the way, always at night. O'Bannon, O'Bannon only works at nighttime because you can't tell how much time is passing. <laughs> oh, it's daylight, like you could tell, but at night, okay. you have no idea what time it is. Interesting. I don't so, know if that that was his thing. So Dark Star did begin its life as a student film. It's supposed to be a 45-minute student film to be shot on 16 millimeter with a budget of about $1,000 that was going to be supplied by the school. And it was going to be, like like Gary said, it was supposed to be their like senior project. And the original concept was Carpenters. Uh, he described it as truck drivers in space, which is something we'll hear probably more next week on the movie we're talking about. Mm. Uh, and then O'Bannon quote fleshed out many of the original ideas and he contributed a lot of to a lot of the scripts like funnier moments like the comedy in it a lot of that is is O'Bannon's and on the final film the two of them share a screenwriting credit they pitched it kind of like an anti 2001 oh um, for sure yeah yeah both I mean were- even the poster plays on that it, it says like a spaced out odyssey or something yeah right right <laughs> nice. both guys were fans of Kubrick but to hear O'Bannon talk about it it was just uh funny to him that um he had a quote that said the movie takes this enormous concept of space flight then the evolution and manipulation of man that puts you on this gigantic spacecraft headed to Jupiter and it's going to take years to get there and then it bores you silly with yeah tedium day to day jogging watching tv eating meals i love that yeah. <laughs> but uh but they were affected by that like uh, jc talked about o'bannon talks a lot about strange love when he talks about this movie um and carpenter talks a lot about uh waiting for godot 
they just love that like absurdist humor and yeah. uh just that sort of thing that's what they were going for here and uh i'm mean, sure we'll talk about it but they were definitely going for a comedy feel and i don't think yeah, that everybody yeah. got that no they definitely did not so they <laughs> began developing the film in about 1970 filming on a sound stage at usc but the film's journey would be a pretty strange one and four years later now on a soundstage in Hollywood, the film would be completed with a final budget of about $60,000, mostly raised from friends and family. It was kind of a stop and start process. They would make like 10 minutes worth of footage, show that to some potential investors, make another 10 minutes, repeat the process over and over and over until they actually were able to finish the movie. And this was very much like a student production, at least at, at first. Uh, they would shoot in closets instead of sound stages, using styrofoam for spacesuits and uh, ice trays for the control panels. I think there's a muffin tin on the front of the space suit yeah. at one point. <laughs> there definitely is. Yeah, and his I wife, spotted that. <laughs> that was O'Bannon, and uh, his his wife says that when he's he had never to, seen a muffin tin before. Yeah, when he talks about <laughs> yeah. it later, that he's just like, you know, I wouldn't do that again. But I had never seen a muffin tin before, and it looked exotic <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was filmed like gary said almost entirely at night but that wasn't necessarily because of, of o'bannon only wanting to work at night it was because most of the cast and crew had day jobs also they were still students Ooh. and while carpenter receives and i think deserves the credit as the film's director o'bannon should really share credit as one of the true creators of this film uh, in front of and behind the camera he was integral to the production he worked not only as the film's writer but its editor production designer and special effects supervisor like he did he had more jobs on this than carpenter did wow. carpenter had two three three carpenter had three before we get into it too much more i do want to give a kind of a few notes on some of the other guys who worked behind the scenes on this film because remember everyone working on this was a student at the time while they didn't have any real experience before this film a lot of people who were involved in this behind the scenes and various you know crew member roles went on to have long successful careers in filmmaking so this is kind of you know we talked about the, the family tree of like these genre movies like this you start looking at some of the people who, who were going to usc at the time and who happened to work on this and they've worked on some monumental stuff so ron cobb was a, a designer he was responsible for the design of the dark star spaceship itself mm. cobb was a fellow student there at usc and he would go on to be a production designer or work in the art department on films like conan the barbarian james cameron's aliens raiders of the lost ark the abyss avatar like he's a, he does a lot of james cameron movies while o'bannon loved kind of making sketches of spaceship designs and aliens it was cobb who brought a sense of reality to the film's design mm. he was he was an illustrator for the los angeles free pet free press a political cartoonist and an avid fan of isaac asimov and as a fan of isaac asimov he believed that science fiction needed to be based on real science in order to remain relevant so he really tried to create a lot of the design of the spaceship in this as one that would be you know functional for the most part it's very, can, very Star Trek approach to uh, to sci-fi. For yeah. sure. And you can find and, uh, like discussions with him on like some of the designs on like what he did. Like, I mean, they took him like, I think Abana took him to, they had a house of pancakes near the school they talked about. And he immediately. The International started. House of Shit is what they called it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he starts uh, sketching out stuff and uh, yeah, just all the practical things and missed opportunities he thought he had seen in like sci-fi movies that yeah. they should or could have done. And uh, so like in this one, I remember some of the stuff he was saying was just like the way space flights portrayed uh, the slim shape of the ship, like to be more efficient, the crew quarters in the back uh, to be away from like potential shock waves and that kind of stuff, like as it's flying. And anyway, just uh, he, he put a lot Not of necessarily thought. stuff the audience is going to think about, but a different approach than what had been done with sci fi so far. And, and you also have to remember, this is before Star Wars and before Alien. So prior to this, space travel and films and television on stuff like Star Trek or 2001 tended to be a very sanitized, very clean looking, mm -hmm. and paid very little effort to show what real space travel might look like. But Cobb and O'Bannon were determined to make this, make the inside of their spacecraft seem practical. You know, it wasn't, it was function over form essentially mm -hmm. it was what would what would actually work versus what looked good on a screen it feels very lived in it does and that, that had never that whole lived in approach i mean star wars and alien get all the credit for that mm -hmm. because they popularized it more than this but this movie did it 
you know, this is three years before Star Wars. So after designing the Dark Star, the, the ship, Cobb would hand the design off to a guy named Craig Jean, who was a special effects artist who specialized in building miniatures. And he would actually go on to work on everything from Close Encounters of the Third Kind to multiple Star Trek movies and TV shows. Like he was the main miniatures guy on a lot of Star Trek. Then Tommy Lee Wallace, who Gary mentioned earlier, he was a childhood friend of Carpenter's. He was the film's art director. Wallace, of course, would go on to work with Carpenter more later on in his career, helping to design the Michael Myers mask in Halloween. I mean, he's responsible for Michael Myers' look, you know, and he Sweet. was also the director of Halloween 3. Uh, and also the It miniseries, I believe, right? Didn't he do, yeah, do the It miniseries? He did the It miniseries. Yeah. He did like Amityville so, 2. He's, he's done a lot of stuff. He was brought Friday into... Night 2, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. He was there to help Dan... Uh, like he got brought into, he, he talks a lot about they couldn't match 2001's antiseptic look, I think is how he put it. And so they were trying to go the exact opposite, barely working, falling apart. They said, you know, to just describe like just, it was, it's like a effed up space, like just this cramped quarters. And then outside it's always wires and two by fours and stuff. And then the, like you mentioned, like ice trays for buttons, uh, push pins in different places, anything that had texture and that light could shine through it. They were using, yeah. <laughs> um, they're talking about how cr- cramped it was like that opening scene where it shows the scene where they're like cramped all cramped in, cramped in that control, pa- yeah, yeah, control area. And the camera like moves through them. They were talking about, it's just like an old, little wind up camera on a plank and they just have it like pulling it back. And everybody's like up with their arms in the air, sucking in. Yeah as much as they can so it can move through them. And then as soon as it passes them, they have to act like they're working. Really it's quick. a great <laughs> shot, honestly. That was the shot that like, because it's so early on in the film, I was like, shit, man, Carpenter like knew what he was doing from a visual standpoint, like immediately. Because that is like not a shot that you see in like a little student film shot on 16 millimeter. It's crazy, mm-hmm. man. They, it's, they they talked about like the uh, the dome on top of the ship, you know, where the guy's sitting up there. And, yeah, R2-D2. Uh, yeah. But that dome is like just this, it was it was like a little mini dome sprayed with some kind of dulling agent. And they said that, um, you know, it's actually like two feet in front of the camera. And then there's like a long hallway where the chair is and the guy's laying on the floor. Oh. And so like he like slowly gets up off the floor, but it looks so like, clever. you know, just the way it's all it set is- up, like he's inside the dome. You would never know that by looking at it. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's just insane to me. I don't yeah. know. Just, I, just people thinking way outside Innovation. the box. I mean when you when you're when you're that's what I love when we talk about these like lower budget genre movies especially genre movies because it's it's easier to do a lower budget like drama like character based where it's mostly dialogue and you know whatnot obviously you've still got all the expense of the actual film and sets and stuff but I love talking about these like low budget genre movies where people just have to get creative mm-hmm. you know like in order to to really they're portraying space travel right and they had they had a thousand dollars i mean then they had six thousand dollars and eventually they had sixty thousand dollars we'll get into how that happened but still that's peanuts that's no money and they're able to to recreate space travel yeah i mean the budget shows at times but there are some things that they're doing like like what gary just described that's like that is very clever just really clever to be able to figure that out yeah man i mean you're talking about i mean these space suits are like thrown together i think they were like a fire jacket and ski gloves or something they're and just a like toy duct taped astronaut helmet yeah a toy astronaut yeah. helmet and i even remember like <laughs> hearing a, i forget the actor's name right off the top of my head but in the helmet brian he Norell? Breathe. yeah i think it's brian norrell he's talking about yeah. he can't breathe inside uh, side of it no bannon's actually the one who helps him out finally they run a tube up like through the suit and into the helmet so he's like having to breathe through the tube that's poking out the back of the suit or whatever. Until they so, say action. Until they say action, then he could spit out the tube. Well, <laughs> like, not only was he couldn't breathe, but it was fogging up the inside of the thing. Right, right. With his yeah. breath, you know. So the film cinematographer was a guy named Douglas Knapp. He would work with Carpenter on his next film, uh, Assault on Precinct 13. And he also served as the cinematographer on most episodes of Star Trek Voyager and Enterprise. Ooh. Yeah, I'm it's sure like throwing a Star on. Trek references for Todd. Yay! Every time I see them now, I make sure to note them down. It's a lot. There's a lot. Like the last Quite several episodes, there's been some sort of Star Trek connection. It's no kind of crazy in this one. Honestly. I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> and then Nick Castle, another friend of Carpenter's, was a camera assistant on the film. 
and also played the uncredited role of the alien in the film. We'll get to the alien in a minute, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Castle, of course, would go on to play a pretty important role in another Carpenter film, uh, where another one where you couldn't see his face. Nick Castle was the original Michael Myers, a.k.a. The Shape in John Carpenter's oh, Halloween. I yep. thought I read He'd it. also go on to be a director <laughs> himself. His most well-known film was probably The Last Starfighter. Which is one of my favorite movies ever. But Great movie. Props to Castle, though. Yeah, they he was one of those guys that was around there they just described as having timing. Like he just always seemed to have timing down for everything. Just he as just seems like a good dude, honestly. Like yeah. I would like to meet Nick Castle one day. Yeah, they said like comedic timing and everything, but yeah, I mean, obviously proven here and with Michael Myers and stuff, he's just he just knows how to bring life to something. So one, uh, Gary talked about a couple of the like innovative techniques that they used uh, on this film, like the the dome thing, and you know, uh, another one of the ones that they did that I thought was really cool was creating some special effects because obviously there's no CGI, you know, and they have a minuscule budget for special effects. So one of the things that they did that I thought was really interesting was how Dan O'Bannon depicted the dark star going into hyperspace. And that's, and by that, I mean, like when you see them go and the stars turn into streaks, basically, you know? Mm. Uh, So to do this, he created an animated effect where he would track the camera while leaving the shutter open. So they had these stars, you know, on like a black screen They'd move the camera through it, leave the shutter open, and it turned those, by, by having a longer shutter time, the stars turned into streaks. Pretty lo-fi way to figure that out, but but clever. And, you know, that doesn't seem like a big deal now because we see this effect everywhere now, but this was three years before Star Wars would utilize and popularize the same effect. But Dark Star is actually thought to be the first depiction of a spaceship jumping into hyperspace in a film. So this is actually... The first time that that particular effect, which we see in Star Wars, we see in Star Trek, like all all kinds of shows where something goes into hyperdrive or warp drive or whatever, you see the stars turn into streaks. It started here on Dark Star. Yeah, they say like, you know, obviously we've mentioned him a few times, but that George Lucas had to have seen this movie coming out of USC, another student film that was really popular. I made a joke about R2-D2 earlier, but I legit think that that dome on top of the ship was in George Lucas's mind when he visualized R2 sitting That's on the back point. of the ship. That's a good point. I mean, it could be. Ship. Yeah. You know? But definitely the the hyperdrive effect is uh, that this was the first time it had ever been used. And and oddly enough, I mean, O'Bannon even talks about um, THX was the first time he had really ever seen uh, in, a, in a ship like this, like video monitors doing the things that they were doing. And yeah. he was so impressed and wanted to do that in this movie. So they did it. And then later, George Lucas. So I, I, we know George Lucas has seen it because actually I remember now Dan O'Bannon saying that George Lucas tapped he him a job. <laughs> for Star Wars <laughs> yeah. with some of the effects because of like the, the, the animation on the on the computer screens. Right, because mm. he saw what O'Bannon had done with the computer screens in this movie. So he was like, yeah. so we did a nice little two step. This is yeah. like a this is like the godfather of sci-fi, the godfather of like modern sci-fi films. Modern sci-fi, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I mean, and they were playing on two thousand one, so you could say two thousand one is the original right. innovator, but they were also sort of subverting what two thousand one did in a way. Mm. So O'Bannon wasn't the only one multitasking on the film. You know, I said he had, you know, he's a production designer, art, art director, all this stuff. But Carpenter, you know, of course, he was the director and the writer, but. He also, as he would later become known to do, composed the film's score using a modular synthesizer. And I love the score to this movie. Man, you can uh, totally hear it. Like it just, it, uh, everything it a, from here on, like is in this yes. movie. <laughs> it's a great Carpenter score that doesn't get discussed as much as some of his other synthesizer scores. But man, it adds, there's something about it that adds production value to the film. And they did it using a synthesizer because obviously we can't afford an orchestra, you know, so uh, that's the most cost effective way to do it. And it is just, I think, I think it just adds a whole layer to this film that really just puts the movie on another level, really. Yeah. Um, from my understanding, that's something that gets added later with, with Jack Harris that like he had pitched to Jack Harris to establish himself. He had done music. He had established himself with music. Yeah. yeah. USC and had done it on a, uh, like, I forget something doe or I can't remember the name of it. He had done something for some music uh, in another film. Cause he was always trying to get that in there, but um, he had to like pitch it to Harris to let him score the entire movie. Cause he knew exactly what it wanted to, what he wanted yeah. it to sound like. 
I don't know, man, just these people. And, and one, one of the cool things about O'Bannon and Carpenter that they both liked was bucking authority. So like this soundstage is, I think, where they're using the film. They're, you're supposed to get it for like two weeks locked down. That's it. That's all you've got. And yeah. they would proceed to use this thing for months and months and months and months. Like they would just sneak in there and do do some of this stuff. Uh, Brian Norell does some great stuff on a documentary I watched. And, uh, you know, they came and that got there be light or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, it's a great uh, doc. He was uh, he was talking about, you know, he was I think he had he had been pulled into animating title sequences for the howling, he said. And John Carpenter came to him and uh, said, you know, he, he had another project he was working on in December. And John's like, it'll be November. We'll do it in November and we'll be done. He's like, all right. And he said, then it was that November. And it was the next year in November and the next year in November. <laughs> He's like, it just never stopped. But uh, kept going. Yeah. But anyway, he just uh, they it, it's just funny hearing them tell the stories like that cow guy uh, who plays a boiler. They said, nobody knows where that guy came from. Like, he just was like a business major John Carpenter found or something. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have any other credits at all on IMDb. Yeah. He just like brought him in and said they never saw him not on set. Like they never saw him off the you know, outside of the movie. Like he was <laughs> so just weird. there for the movie. And uh, <laughs> they said the only story I could find fun about him was the switchblade scene where he's like stabbing it between his fingers that that was not scripted. He just started doing that and legit does stab his finger <laughs> and, <laughs> and plays it off and they kept rolling. And so he didn't go, he didn't sell it until afterwards. <laughs> and, so anyway. well, going back to the music, the, uh, that, the, the song that plays over the opening credits, that Benson, Arizona song, which cracks me up. It's so funny to me. <laughs> uh, that was co-written by Carpenter. Carpenter did the music and then Bill Taylor did the lyrics and a friend of theirs who was a singer who uh, did, ended up doing the vocals on it. But it's, I don't know why, but it's really funny to me that that song plays over. And and the the lyrics are really funny and somewhat relative re- relevant to the film. Uh, but it there's something about a country song playing over the opening credits of a sci-fi movie that just is really funny to me. Yeah, oh, it yeah. just it, it it works so well. Like it's just something's fun about that. Just the mix of the country western thing and sci-fi. Yeah. Like it's just well, and, to me, uh, it kind of it kind of lends it uh blue collar quality of like yeah yeah again sure. lived in and you know these guys are just they're doing the job man and that's 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 their thing well yeah. somebody I, I feel like i read somewhere that they had considered like a classical song or something else maybe maybe it was even O'Bannon on this part too but it had pitched the country song because of the truck drivers in the space aspect of it right like, right they'd be listening to country and uh side note bill taylor tells a story that benson is just a place that he was visiting his girlfriend and he got he broke down in benson arizona and yeah. on christmas day and two guys helped him out and got his car fixed and got it back on the road and he's always remembered them as being nice that so they were like what's the most out of the way like random ass place we can think of and he's like benson, benson, arizona. Arizona. <laughs> and now benson arizona actually has a road called dark star road oh, oh really because nice. nice. this, this movie's their claim to fame i guess <laughs> that's so cool man um but uh, everybody in here just uh this is gonna play into somebody needs a nap later so i just want to establish that bill taylor guy he's worked on a lot too since then he's in a visual effects supervisor oh on uh, huge stuff i mean his his IMDb is a mile long. Like if you look yeah, at his wow. filmography, it's wild. And that Brian um, Norell guy, he doesn't do anything stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And Brian Norell is like an, an animator. Uh, he's worked yeah. on like Sesame Street for forever, and like uh, worked with George Lucas on Twice Upon a Time. He's done his own shorts and stuff, and won awards. And uh, he teaches cartooning at the Charles Schultz Museum. So oh wow uh, wow I was looking that up but uh that's pretty cool yeah so that's all these guys cool. are like really talented people that that go on yeah. to to do things you know even if oh yeah lots like of things straight up things. actors or something and not everyone I mean most of them are not like a name that everyone would recognize but that's the case on a lot of guys who work behind the scenes on movies like people know who Steven Spielberg is people know who Christopher Nolan is people know who Quentin Tarantino is but they don't know all these other you know pe- who who did the special effects, who did the art direction, who did the music even a lot of times, you know, it's, I mean, just because they're not getting all the glory doesn't mean that they don't deserve some sort of recognition. Yeah. They're, they're great, man. Those, those art map paint. I mean, the, the spaceship flying, that's what blew me away when I was first watching this was just like, this is early on. They're doing a pretty good job of these spaceships. I mean, it's cheesy, but it's, 
it's still like if you had me do it like you set me down or like film the space scene i'd be like i don't fucking know how to do that but they were like <laughs> these like models on dollies like going towards like the matte paintings and stuff like that mm-hmm. like that's kind of cool like they're it's i don't cool. know wild another one i thought was interesting and since i'm just talking about it now was like carpenter wanted the bomb uh carrier like bomb uh 20 or whatever it's called uh he, he wanted it to have something for when they were communicating with it that it looked like it was talking back you like know not just it was up. just sitting there but yeah it like that's up. a bannon's voice by the way oh yeah yeah as the and bomb <laughs> so it flashes lights but it doesn't really have flashing lights on it you know it's just like they built the right like silver plating or whatever and then they like clicked a light towards it and it reflected the light and i just I thought they put reflective tape on it that's what it was yeah yeah they put reflective tape on it in the places where they wanted the lights and then yeah they would like click a light while they were filming to make it quote unquote light up but it's not it's really just reflecting the light that they are shining at it's just it. one of those dinky wow. things that i think nobody would think about and he's just like well obviously that thing's lighting up but it's like well how much harder is it to make a thing that lights up <laughs> and you know they well, they couldn't, or they just yeah, they didn't, didn't have, have time money. or money. And so they just put the reflective tape in there and they're just like clicking this light at it. And it just, it looks like it's lighting. I don't know, man. It's yeah. just movie magic dog. It gets me. It's cool. <laughs> it's yeah. cool. So Carpenter and O'Bannon, they worked well together because they were both intense perfectionists, like both of them, which, you know, so they wanted everything to be perfect, which had sounds pretty high stress to ever for everyone else on set. But they were proud of the film that they completed by the end of the shoot. They knew it wasn't like 2001, but they were pretty sure that this is a movie that can help kickstart our careers. And yeah, like you know, like we said, it was originally conceived and created as a school project. But they knew that they had something kind of special, and they started trying to sell the film, but no one was buying. And this was this was like in the days of The Exorcist and the early films of Scorsese and Coppola, you know. Space movies seemed old fashioned at the time. This is before Star Wars kind of brought them back. I mean, yeah, you'd had 2001, but that was a decade earlier, almost. Studios just didn't want to touch a a space movie. It just didn't seem like something that would sell. Well, I I think this this is important for, for where this whole story is going here real quick, if I can, is that one thing to know about John Carpenter here that I think is going to influence his motivation or his, so you can get a better understanding of him, is that he was... During this time also at USC, he became a member of a crew and they were working on the movie, uh, The Resurrection of Bronco Billy. And it was a Western movie. It was a short film. And the school backed it and they spent like two to $3,000 on it to get it made. They released it on 35 millimeter. John Carpenter was one of the main writers and got some director's experience, but it's like uncredited on this movie. And uh, I mean, I think he's credited as a writer and it's, it's important in this way. So this movie gets sent out and it wins an Oscar for best yeah, short, best, sure, best live action short. Yeah. And so when that happened, the school sent school reps and they sent like one student. I think he said his name was like John Longnecker or something to the Oscars to collect the award. And, uh, and I want to say it was uh Brian Norell talks about that he saw John. He said they were all just in their dorm rooms watching the Oscars that night and it won. <laughs> and John came out to get a Coke. <laughs> they met in the uh, cafeteria. He was just like, Hey, congratulations, John. And John's like, Hey, thanks, man. And they like shook hands and he went back to his dorm room. Yeah. And <laughs> he said that later that, you know, to John Carpenter talks about this. He says that later they like bring back, the trophy in a brown paper bag like they the stu- <laughs> the school walks it through and they're like hey here's your trophy look at this he won this and they're like cool and he's like do i get to like keep it or like what what happens with it and they're like well we'll just put it somewhere we'll just you know or whatever he's like okay well uh you know so what what's this mean for me and they're like well nothing <laughs> like, yeah. it's, just, nothing. it's uh well the way that the studios or the way that the school saw it was that they were like the studio who essentially owned the film because they were funding it for the students yeah that 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 is how they saw it so so earlier when i was saying like this the school's learning these things i think from possibly from thx which goes on to become like a feature length movie and i don't know if the school made anything off that but with this one they totally took everything and Carpenter even says he was like asking for like, well, can we get reimbursed for some of the stuff we spent on it? 
and like that we spent and uh the school's like no nah, just they just like waved him off and carpenter said it fucked him up like that was it he was just like well i'm not playing this game anymore how who are you like where did i yeah. sign off that you get to take a movie that i made and you get to like what kind of art school is this he was pissed like he he talks yeah. about it a lot they you say well if, if you're if like, you had art school and no you, stake in this if you go to art school and you paint a painting the painting doesn't belong to the art school it still belongs to the artist right right so that's the same concept here the film should still belong to the filmmakers i say all that to say that so you can imagine that John Carpenter's mindset already is not only that he's immediately just like a buck authority guy, but he's also already a buck this school too. And uh, yeah. he's kind of like, I want to, I already know what's going to happen with dark star if it does anything. And so his goal from the beginning is like you, you brought it up, Justin, but just that he's seeing it as an out. Like, this is how I can get a feature made. This is yeah. like, this is the first step to like a longer process to get it out of here and you can already see too maybe the process for him becoming a cranky old bastard someday uh, <laughs> yeah. is that he's already at this point he's just like also nobody's taking my shit away from me ever again so that's kind of his mentality i think during this time yeah so they're shopping the film around like i said nobody's nobody's touching it and then one day john landis director john landis showed a version of the film to a producer by the name of Jack Harris. Now, we, we mentioned Jack Harris briefly earlier, but uh, Harris was a guy who had begun his career as a vaudeville pr promoter before oh, wow. kind of working his way up to being a B-movie producer. And his big success in the 50s was the the, er, the original version of The Blob. You know, and that, was a, that was a pretty big hit. But his specialty, especially by this point, was picking up student films for kind of next to nothing and then releasing them theatrically and making a little bit of money off of it. And he had produced John Landis's first film, a movie called Schlock in 1970. And they thought that, you know, maybe we could do this again with, with Dark Star. But when he first saw Dark Star, he wasn't that impressed with it. He thought it had slow spots. He thought the, the quote unquote philosophical or philosophy student dialogue uh, was kind of boring to him. But he did see something in it that he could exploit. Yeah, he was he was kind of a guy like you you kind of described him pretty well. And by the way, they were worried this whole time that the school was going to sue them if they found yeah. out that they were shopping this thing around. So back to that other story, but eventually I think what happened there is the school started to look at it like, well, if it does make it, if nothing else, it's good advertisement for us if John Carpenter. Yeah, well, once it started getting uh known as known as it would get, they yeah, they just kind of saw it as like it's not worth it for us to sue because then we're also going to be seen as the bad guys, but it'll be like, Oh, a USC student made this movie. Right. And that makes people want to come to USC. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, to Jack Harris, I mean, he, he was like a big fan, like you said, of schlock. I, I saw another one of his uh, Equinox um, that he was, yeah, like, which was made by, Oh man, Dennis Murin, who did the special effects in Star Wars, I think yeah, did that movie. Yeah. And uh so he 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 liked finding up and comers, like people with nothing that had had some kind of unique idea. And supposedly he was interested because he he did like sci-fi and was interested in getting into that. But uh yeah, it was definitely these boring parts. He it, <laughs> you mentioned the blob thing. Carpenter hated him immediately, but he said that Harris constantly brought that up that that was the like blob. his thing he said every conversation movie. would be jack harris would bring up like well i did the blob <laughs> well on the blob we did this <laughs> right <laughs> and when, when they met with harris he immediately started telling them how to change the film he's like i hate the first scene he thought it's too long and boring the way that he describes it is like it's in the living quarters of you know, the kids and it's just like silent and they're like sleeping. And then the way he says it, the way he describes it, it says for seven minutes, you hear snoring and farting, get rid of that, <laughs> which they did, which is probably honestly a good idea. Harris, Harris like, said, wants to see this. <laughs> yeah. Harris said he hated the title. We told him he hated the title somehow. I guess they kept that, but he said that it was like when they brought it to him, he had to get, in. he had, he had, uh, 90 minutes they had worked on like they had been adding to it or whatever they had gotten it up to 90 minutes or something by 
when Carpenter pitched it to him, he's like, can I see a screener? So he's like, okay. So he takes him to see a screening. And he said that scene, and he's like in the sleeping room, and he's like, it's a still cam. And the astronauts are just just sleeping. And it's, sleeping. it's just, <laughs> he's like, but you had this like 90 minute movie and 30 minutes was probably straight garbage. And uh, <laughs> cut out. And he said, and I, he said he, he, he waited like through that seven minutes. He said he kept turning around to John Carpenter being like, is something else going to happen? And he's like, yeah, yeah, just stick with it. Just stick with it. And uh, he says, it's like, nobody's going to want to see this. Yeah. And he's like, John, you can't start this out or the audience is going to go to sleep too with these guys. He says, uh, John, we've got to make a solid hour 25 out of this thing. And he said, Carpenter's like, I know. That's why the guys snore for so long. <laughs> he said, no, John, you can't do it that way. <laughs> it's like when you write a paper in school and everything is very, very, very important. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Jack Harris also wanted more sex appeal in the film. He went to this meeting. He's like, well, how about we add some women in bikinis on a beach? I'm like, what beach are you talking about, Jack? You Harris? know, the, the space beach. <laughs> I don't maybe he's talking about those women on the walls, you know, like the pinups yeah, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so during this meeting, like Carpenter sitting there, he's being quiet. I'm, I'm sure he's internally dying inside, but he's being fairly quiet as Carpenter was wont to do. O'Ban is just stewing because every time he would try to speak up to defend the parts of the film that Harrison like, Harris would just like cut him off and not let him talk. So he he does not like jack harris from the beginning but finally harris said okay here's my deal he's like i will give you the money to finish the film in exchange for 75 percent of the profits but only if you make the changes that i want carpenter and o'bannon they took the money you know they, they wanted to get their movie made and here's what o'bannon would later say about this it says quote this was a real turning point for both of us, I believe. I disliked Harris and wanted to get away. If this was the way the game is played, I wanted no part of it. But John concluded that he had to learn how to play. And that's something we'll learn about John Carpenter as we discuss him more, is that he, John Carpenter knew how to play the politics when he needed to, you know? Yeah, I mean, he he definitely, from this point on, is like the guy who's like, I know what I got to do to make this thing work in my favor. So I'm yeah. going to like you said, play the game. He was able to get the game back together with this money that they got. And I mean, for him, it worked out. They found producer studio, which is where they shot like the rest of this, which is, will be which the is same. the same place that eating alive was shot. Yeah. A good point. Yeah. I, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, where eating alive is shot. <laughs> uh, it's where he'll go back to for like, I think like sold on precinct 13 and the fog. He'll use that mm -hmm. same studio. So like, I mean, there's stuff working out for John O'Carpenter here, but, but John or John O'Carpenter, John O'Carpenter, <laughs> <laughs> Dan, o, he says that John Carpenter had uh, one thing I saw. He said that you can, there's a scene and I could not find it. And he didn't t say exactly where it is, but he said, there's a scene. If you watch close enough and, and he can pick it out uh, on this movie where it's like at the end of the scene and you can see Dan O'Bannon saying, fuck Harris. He was not a fan. He was very open about it. Did Jack Harris talks about it. Jack Harris calls Dan O'Bannon troubled. And, uh, <laughs> but he says that for Carpenter, he says he was very unemotional and that's how you do business. Yeah. So like we said, dark star began pretty small, but it did begin to grow and eventually became something much different than what it was original, which was just, you know, just a, a student film. So after they, you know, cut all, I think, you know, like the bullshit that Jack Harris didn't want in the movie, like guys farting for seven minutes. It, it was like, you had like a 45 minute film on your hands, which was too long for a collection of shorts that could play at a film festival, but too short for an actual theatrical release. And then Jack Harris gives them about 60 grand to turn the film into a feature length and, and move the production to a real studio. As Gary mentioned, it was producer studio in Hollywood where Hooper had shot uh, Eaten Alive. And then to fill out the runtime, they added a monster. So that the stuff with the alien, the alien that chases O'Bannon through the elevator shaft, that was not in the original script or film at all. So if you're watching this movie and you're like, this doesn't feel like it has anything to do with the rest of the movie. Oh, that's why. Because it wasn't originally supposed to be in the movie at all. <laughs> you know, so they're they're making this scene. They, they wanted to create this alien. And they ran into this problem of how do you make a convincing space alien when you have, like, no money to do any special effects with? So O'Bannon's original idea was just to do it kind of the old-fashioned way. A guy in a suit, you know? 
uh, 1950s alien guy in a suit, like the thing from another world. He bought a rubber suit from a rental house there in Hollywood, and it looked like shit. Like the seams were showing it. You know, you could see the zipper. Like it was, it looked fake. It looked like somebody wearing a costume. So they kept brainstorming. And then inspiration hit when they're, they're hanging out on set. O'Bannon and Carpenter are hanging out on set one day. And someone walked by with a, a giant a giant beach ball. And you could see the beach ball and you could see their feet kind of underneath. And it looked like the beach ball was walking on feet. So they thought, you know what? We know we can't make this like a realistic alien. So why not just make it funny? So that's what they did. They took a giant beach ball. They spray painted it red. They put some rubber feet on the bottom. And then they asked their friend Nick Castle to be the puppeteer on it. Those feet, by the way, should look familiar. They are uh, creature from the Black Lagoon hands. Yeah, they look they're, like it. <laughs> yeah, they're. Uh, they. I think they said they got them from like uh, who was it? Like Post Prop Company or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's like uh, yeah, they're basically they're creature from the Black Lagoon's hands, uh, walking on the bottom of those feet. Yeah, and I I actually love the sequence of the movie. I mean, I know that it doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of the plot, but it does kind of hint at things to come in both Carpenter's and, and O'Bannon's careers because the way that Carpenter shoots the alien kind of evokes the way he would later shoot Michael Myers. Like the, the alien would just kind of sit at one end of the hallway staring camera turns away and it's gone. And then you turn around and it's somewhere else, you know, it just appears. It's very Michael Myers. That, like It's so in insane. Way. I was thinking the same thing. And just like, even the, the beats that he gives with the music and stuff, it's just like, it's, there's it's some, a, surprisingly effective suspense sequence for something that looks so dumb. Right. You know, right. Yeah. And, and of course the elevator scene in it's same way. Yeah. 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 And, and of course it would also kind of be the blueprint for alien and stuff. You've got a, a lone alien in these long, seemingly never ending corridors. Like it's very much kind of what O'Bannon would do a couple years later. I found myself, surprisingly stressed during the elevators yeah so did i dude i thought <laughs> yeah. it worked i was like this is really impressive for these guys the elevator scene really has is. tension and during the filming of the sequence they created the illusion that o'bannon was i don't even think we mentioned that o'bannon does also star in this movie have we even mentioned that o'bannon plays pin back in this movie he's like well i, I think characters. i mentioned that he, carpenter had originally <laughs> impro- approached him to yeah. act but yeah i don't think we really established that <laughs> well, he yeah was, so yeah, o'bannon is, is. pin back that's that's the, the guy we're talking about for the next few weeks is the guy who plays pin back in this movie and in most they had to create- add it on stuff because i mean he's a he's a big character in this because he's the one that was always available like he was the one that was there constantly when all these other guys had other stuff going on. So yeah. Anyway. And as the movie goes on, it's revealed that he's a much bigger character than you might think at the beginning of the movie. But during this alien sequence, they had to create a way to make it look like O'Bannon was hanging from an elevator shaft. So they did it in a pretty low tech way, which was turning a camera on its side. So this is all being shot at uh, at producer studio. I believe they had these like long hallways that were pretty uniform all around so they could make it look like an elevator shaft if you shot it the right way. So for three days, O'Bannon had to be on his back in a sweltering corridor pretending to be fighting gravity. So what they did is they basically had a, essentially like a plank that had a little bit of give to it that O'Bannon was laying on so that he would be look like he was swaying and his feet could dangle and things like that. But he's laying on this plank for three days Well, they say even the other side of it's not really like it's not uh, hooked in. There's guys on the other side of that wall, like pushing down on it to like keep him supported. So it helps to like make that movement of like he would have the swaying. He's getting bounced up up and down down on his back the whole time. Yeah. So during the filming of this, he developed an excruciating pain in his side that took away his appetite and would send him to the hospital for a few days later. And it ended up being the first time that he was hospitalized with a lifelong struggle with a a bowel condition, Crohn's disease, that would eventually take his life. They they brought him in for appendicitis, I think, or that that was the initial. Because that's about where it was hurting, was in his like appendix area. Yeah, and uh, I think they. I I could swear I saw where his wife said they even took out his appendix, but they think that yeah, this was the first attack probably from the Crohn's disease. And he always complained about stomach aches, and a lot of people thought O'Bannon was a hypochondriac, like that he was just making this stuff up basically. But uh, 
anyway, that's important just to mention here. I mean, this is the first attack room, and this is going to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you'll attack. remember from last week's episode, Crohn's disease is what Heather O'Rourke was initially misdiagnosed with. Oh yeah, with her her intestinal issues. Yeah, it's it's no joke. I've had have, have a friend who has it, and it's I. It's, I was almost diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was younger. Or not oof. younger, like I mean, this was uh, eight nine years ago. Oh, I went wow. to the I went to the emergency room with some intestinal stuff, and they oh, thought yeah. at first that I was that I had Crohn's disease till they did a few more tests. Yeah, Jeez, that would have sucked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've I've heard from multiple people who had turns it. out I had really bad food poisoning. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's still not, not fun. <laughs> no, still not fun. So in regards to kind of the padding out of the film's runtime, O'Bannon would later say, he said, and this is actually in that documentary that Gary quoted earlier, which let's go ahead and say that documentary, Let There Be Light, it's on the Dark Star Blu-ray, big source for this episode. Oh, yeah. yeah another definitely. another big source for this episode is a book called Shock Value by Jason Zinneman, which is a, it's my favorite film history book in my library of film history books that i have it is essential and incredible and i i could not have done this episode without that book basically because they they interview everyone involved in the making of well, this that fucking doc is like two hours long too i know that's, that's pretty long, impressive it's longer than the movie yeah <laughs> <laughs> so anyway o'bannon in but that how much snoring, how much snoring and farting is at the beginning there's no farting or snoring just just really me this time, todd just me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but in that documentary, Obana would say, we had what would have been the world's most impressive student film, and it became the world's least impressive professional film, uh, which I think, and I'll get into this in a minute, but I think he's selling the movie short a little bit. But what he, he, he didn't like that they had to kind of do this. And Jack Harris, you know, he bought the film, but he didn't keep it for that long. because so he was in the middle of a nasty divorce. He was having some financial trouble, had to sell the film. So he sells it to Bryanston Distributing. Now, if you're a longtime Love listener of the show, if, if you've been listening to the show for the last couple of months, if you're listening, you Bryanston, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bryanston Distributing was the same mob run company that distributed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre the same oh, year. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this is just a few months. I and mean, this movie gets released a few months after. Sounds like Texas a lot of Chainsaw. speculation, Justin. We don't know anything. And so we would never <laughs> lately say anything. Allegedly. About- Allegedly. It's alleged. From what I hear. <laughs> yeah. So anybody from Bryant's still listening, you do great work and we appreciate it. Yeah. That. Well, they bungled the release of this film. <laughs> <laughs> Just, <laughs> sounds like somebody's getting new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they sent it to over 40 theaters in Los Angeles, but they didn't really promote it. They had good promotional material because they worked with basically the promotional material that Jack Harris had created the posters and stuff, but they didn't really like send it out there properly. Like it was in the newspaper, but ho- audiences didn't really know that the movie existed. Uh, was there a was a trailer, but it wasn't accessible to people. It wasn't in front of movies that people were seeing. Yeah. There was this whole s- part of it too, where they tried to get in front of this uh, group called film X and they did. And it was like the right kind of film students, you know, the people, people that would appreciate film students. So well, film X was like a film festival. Uh, yeah. Film the Los festival. Angeles film festival was originally called film X. That's it. Yeah. But, but it got pretty good, uh, you know, feedback there. So they were feeling good about it. And then it goes to Harris. Well, Harris, what ends up happening for him is he ends up in a, uh, marital issue and so he's divorcing his wife of 30 years and he is uh it's it's apparently a pretty rough one and so he doesn't have time so he gets Bryanston to work on some of this stuff and he and they agree to use all of this stuff so he's like oh this is cool like uh, it's like I'm doing this but I don't have to do all the work but then he finds out that uh you know all this stuff starts coming out that they were attached to the mafia and then uh Harris has to cut ties because he's like, this is the last thing I need. Yeah, I don't need this coming up for my, my divorce, divorce trial. That I'm working with the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> so on opening night, after Bryanson sends it out, uh, Carpenter and O'Bannon, they decide we're going to, they're excited. They're going to go into a movie theater to see how the audience was reacting. You know, this is their first movie. This is awesome. We're really excited. We want to see how people are loving it. And so we, they go to the this theater. They pick a, a movie theater there in Los Angeles. And they asked the ticket taker if they could just, they were like, hey, can we just pop in and see the audience? And the ticket taker says, what audience? 
So <laughs> they go into the theater. There's very few. There's like half a dozen people or something in there. There's like nobody in there. And they just sat in like depressing silence. Like nobody was laughing at the jokes in the film. Uh, nobody seemed to understand or get that it was a a comedy. And even, you know, if you watch the Blu-ray, there's a there's an introduction that Dan O'Bannon wrote for the film that has appeared on a few different Blu-ray and, and DVD releases of it, where he's like, we intended this to be a comedy, but nobody at the time it was released seemed to understand that this was a comedy. They didn't know that they were supposed to be laughing at it. <laughs> so audiences were not, what audiences did get a chance to see it, were not super receptive in it to it because I think they just didn't know what the filmmakers were trying to do. Mm-hmm. So that brings me, Gary, to our, our favorite segment on the show, one where we want to see what, what other, uh, you know, audience members or other viewers of the film might think. And I'm wondering if, if modern viewers have caught on that this is supposed to be a comedy, you know, what people think about it and, and if they, you know, see it as a visionary sci-fi film or it's just a dud. Well, Justin, as you know, internet reviewers are, if anything, they're the most patient and supportive reviewers out there. So <laughs> many people watch dark star and they got the complete context of the film and uh, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, lots of people hated it. It sounds like some people, somebody needs a nap. <laughs> uh, let's see. Lady T says, after reading the reviews, I thought I'd give this one a try. I shouldn't Lady have. Lady T? Lady T. Is that Mr. T's wife? It could be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thought I'd give she, this one a try, she also, and I shouldn't also have. pities the fool. I pity the fool to watch this movie. Uh, what I should have done was paid more attention to the reviews that stated this film isn't for everyone. I would have saved myself some money. Looks like a low budget, which I guess it is, amateurish film along the lines of the Blair Witch Project, which I didn't care for either. But heck, I like that better than this. And yes, I realize they're two totally different genres. It's like watching a homemade movie that maybe your uncle made while following someone around with his camcorder. I will admit that a few scenes made me smile simply because they made me think of the fun the actors and directors must have had making such a campy film. But with that said, I expected more than what I got, so I didn't care for it. Heck, I didn't even finish it. But to its credit, it solved my insomnia, at least for one night. <laughs> <laughs> what a weird comparison to the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> I bet you didn't think you were going to get that. That's the only like low budget film they could think of to compare this to. This movie's apparently good for sleeping. Here's T Blackford. Uh, his review title is Warning, all caps, stay away. This movie is bad on every level bad acting, bad special effects, bad storyline. It's freaking boring. I love the sci fi horror, horror comedy medium, but this film is just straight up bomb. It's not like so bad it's funny. It's just so lame and uneventful. I fell asleep faster than my friend who floated a keg full of NyQuil. I'm telling you, please watch anything else. From the very first scene, you will be able to tell the quality of the film that you are getting yourself into. It's crap. And it never <laughs> gets better from there. Forget about big names like John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon. This was a school project for theirs. How many school projects have you ever done that were even remotely interesting? That's right, none. There is an alien in this movie. Prepared to be scared? Wait, no. Prepare to laugh. Oh, wait, no. Try neither. The alien is just a beach ball with feet. I'm serious. It's a beach ball. And our heroic characters are deathly afraid of it. What's worse is that more than a third of the film is dedicated this, to this inflatable menace. I just can't go on reliving any more of this film. It's bringing back the desire to play Russian roulette. Do yourself a favor and pass on this one. You will thank me. Ooh, bringing back the desire to play Russian roulette. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here. Somebody needs a nap and a therapist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole reason I brought up some of the other stuff that the people working on the movie uh, did is because this last review says one of the worst sci-fi films of all time. I made the mistake of watching Dark Star late one night many years ago. It was one of the stupidest movies I have ever watched. One, bad acting. Two, bad writing. Three, scientifically stupid plot. Destroying an entire planet because its orbit is unstable or in the way will only make matters worse. Instead of having one large, easily avoidable object, you'll have thousands of smaller but equally lethal and more difficult objects to track. 
Four, completely unrealistic characters. A painted beach ball is a space alien? The writers must have been doing too many drugs. Not surprisingly, the majority of actors that starred in Dark Star never did anything else. Of those that did do anything else, the majority never acted again after Dark Star. Therefore, having Dark Star on one's resume was a death star to one's career. Mm, don't think so. It was yeah. written by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who <laughs> understands... <laughs> And I just had to include that one because I was like, wow, you're way off of that last part, bud. You're way off. Everybody did other stuff. Everybody, everybody literally. Oh, I mean, the actors didn't do anything like they didn't become big stars or anything. Brian Orell didn't become a big star, but he's continued to work in the industry for the last 50 years. They're fine. (laughs) And John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon and like everyone else involved, you know, you, you mentioned Bill Taylor earlier, which I was looking at his IMDb. Like the, the, if you just list, the movies that he did matte paintings on after this, you know, he, he worked with freaking Hitchcock on, on family plot. You know, he did the whiz, he did the blues brothers. He did you know, the John Carpenter's the thing he did blade runner. Like to say that this guy didn't do anything after this movie is sort of insane. Right. Right. Yeah. There, everybody, everybody continued to work after this. Yes. Movie. Yeah. And most of them continue to work even to this day. And despite the audiences at the time and and some of these internet reviewers not really responding to the film, it has actually gained a big cult following, probably largely due to the the later careers of its creators. But I mean, at the time that it came out, I kind of do get why some people wouldn't get it because it does look unlike anything that had come before it in terms of sci-fi, you know, like you, you were used to sci-fi being more, I don't know, glamorous, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, space travel looking more glamorous. But O'Bannon created a movie, you know, as, as he and Carpenter called it, it's a movie about truck drivers in space. None of the glamour that you were used to seeing was there. The, these guys, the, the, the characters in it, they weren't like awed or, or amazed by the sights of the universe. They were like bored <laughs> by it. Yeah. And that lived in space aesthetic was one that would, of course, you know, be popularized by Star Wars and then with Alien. I like the idea, though, that they're, you know, not all space jobs are glamorous. You know, you even in Star Wars, you see, you don't really see that. You don't see the janitors on the dark, on the Death Star. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least not, I'm sure that'll, I'm sure that's coming to Disney Plus at some point, but <laughs> right. not yet. <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, to, 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 to complain about that, like that's, part of the problem with the movie i mean that's the point of the movie i mean these yeah. guys are doing a very redundant stupid job like that yeah it's monday that's what the movie's about me and todd were talking about this the other day and i think i really like the way that you described it todd when we, we we were talking it's that you called this clerks in space yeah and yeah. i think that's exactly what it is it's just like this is just three dudes with a job and it's a boring job that they don't really like. And it's very mundane until it isn't. Yeah, exactly. On this particular day. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, you know, looking at the, you know, the basic formula for clerks and dark star, it was very similar. You know, they happen to have, uh, you know, they happen to have a, a convenience store to shoot in while these guys were shooting in hallways and yeah, and, you know, just turning the camera side w- sideways and, uh, you know, using the techniques that they that they learned uh, in school to to their fullest potential, in my opinion, you know, especially a sh- I, I wouldn't even say it's a shoestring budget. It's a shoe thread bu- budget. <laughs> they really they really did as much as they could with what they I mean, had. this movie's got about the same budget as clerks granted you know yeah not, not with an inflation uh taken into account but 60 grand's about what clerks cost i think too right yeah. Only this, these guys are doing it with special effects and shit like yeah yeah uh, all i mean what kevin smith was paying for was film stock mostly exactly yeah, yeah, and maybe paying the actors or buying them lunches and stuff but f- yeah film stock is mostly what he paid for they're having to pay for they're making a spaceship and spaceships and an alien. And, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, it, but, but even story wise, like it kind of fits in the well, clerks think, thing. Cause it, these are just like blue collar dudes working a job. Only this time the job happens to be in space. You know, they're, 
they're not like cool looking. They don't, they're not wearing cool uniforms. Their uniforms are kind of baggy and gross. They've got long hair. They're unkempt. They probably, they look like they probably smell bad. Yeah. You know, their living quarters is trashed. They're they're It's just cluttered with junk with pinup girls on the wall and they're out of toilet paper and they're irritable and they're unappreciated by their corporate overlords. You yeah. You're hundred percent right. That, that scene that, uh, the the scene where Harris had a problem with it was, it was like seven minutes. They were they were I forget who was telling the story. Uh, it, it must have been Bill, but he was saying that the because uh, we're on a first name basis anyway. He uh, <laughs> he was saying like part of that seven minutes was it eventually gets to like where the computer is like telling them like all right rise and shine everybody it's time to get up and then they just stay asleep and it's like all right <laughs> let's start a warm shower and then you could hear the showers come on and they don't move <laughs> like, they all right everybody time. wash your face here's your fresh clothes and they don't move <laughs> and it's just like breakfast is served now and then all of a sudden they're like all right let's go <laughs> like, <laughs> so they're just sitting there in their own filth just like you said just well i think nasty bastards I think with the, um, you know, going back to comparing in comparing it to uh, clerks like we did earlier this week, Justin, when we spoke, I think with this, because I'll be honest, like when I sat down to watch this, I was like, OK, this is going to be fun, kind of hokey, you know, uh, that's supposed to be a comedy. This will be fine. And I did feel it sort of drag on a little bit. And then the, you know, the little beach ball monster uh, beach ball alien comes in and was like okay that's kind of silly whatever but that you know the novelty of that burns off pretty quickly but then when the bomb becomes self-aware and starts quoting the bible <laughs> <laughs> i went holy shit and i think i think the monotony of their daily lives and the silliness of this alien is very disarming you know it, it breaks down like what you might think space should look like which it sounds like that was kind of their whole point you know people were getting used to this uh pristine space from 2001 and maybe other things and so they showed this kind of lived in uh worn uncomfortable yeah yeah version of space and then and then when the computer the bomb becomes self-aware and quotes the bible <laughs> that, that i mean and that's late in the game but like if you've boy is that a reward for folks who stuck it out uh through yeah. the rest of this because you know in talking about comedy some of the comedy doesn't really translate and i'm sure you guys are well aware like comedy especially in film can have a very short shelf life it's it, you know stuff that played well in the 70s and 80s may not play as well as it does today yeah. and when you comedy look at is also like Comedy along with horror, I think, is the most subjective of yes. genres in that you yeah. can't tell somebody why they think something's funny or why they think something is scary. Right. Either they do or they don't. Right, exactly. Or porn. Like what gets my <laughs> dick? What gets my dick hard? Gets my dick hard. Gary yeah. broke Gary broke his governor a long time ago. <laughs> it's not nothing, nothing without tentacles, folks. Let's just I also appreciate they kept blowing up places. They had the 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 bob stuff like the bob carrier things mm -hmm. but i'm like all right well, this is bob 20 so yeah, I'll be, yeah. Ship ain't like that a third big. of the size of the whole ship right exactly <laughs> or they hit the other 19 <laughs> so it sounds like we're it sounds like you liked it todd so i guess this is the the section of the the show we call todd's take yeah i uh <laughs> What do you, I mean, what, oh, it sounds like you enjoyed it overall though, right? I, I did. I was kind of, uh, I was, I was down because we, the past couple things have been some horror and I, I'm a big, and I like sci-fi. So, you know, to, you know, not a horror get, day, though. <laughs> my list, my list is about ready to go folks. If you it better if you be, because we're doing an episode. Yeah, we have people for anyone who's been waiting, it, people are asking for Todd's <laughs> top 10. Uh, for those of you who are, who have been waiting the last few weeks for Todd's top 10 horror movies, they're coming. We're just yeah, going to a bonus episode. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I, I did, I was, uh, you know, excited to sit and watch and then, you know, popped it in Friday night with some pizza and the wife and just, uh, you know, just sat ready to enjoy it and then kind of got sucked into this whole lived in space feel. And I'll be honest, my eyes got a little bit heavy there, you know, probably about a third of the way in. And I was just kind of like, no, this is, you know, let's, let's hang on. Cause you know, 
the names attached to this thing and there's a reason we're talking about it on the show let's 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 hang on here and boy was i pleasantly surprised because i mean i eyebrows up sat up audible response of holy shit (laughs) like I, yeah, this is, this is, this is worth, if, if you haven't seen this and you're about to, and you may think it's going to be slow, just hang on. Um, How do you think the comedy plays? Uh, comedy plays, it, it's a little stale. It's a little stale. Yeah, I get, I so? mean, I, I see what part of the see problem is, going, it's, it's like, a little stale. I, it doesn't come across as a comedy right at first. I, I mean, I guess if yeah. you know, it's a comedy, it does, but it's like, I don't know. Uh, the the it's title of the movie and the way that it looks on the cover it, like it just i mean doesn't... i think the the fact that they play that country song over the opening credits immediately establishes that we're not taking ourselves too seriously on this. Right. i don't know i mean that, I, something I, like that works but that kind of in terms of the comedy i feel like that's their best gag and they kind of i don't right my up favorite, front and it kind of my favorite comedy gag in terms is of comedy. probably um dan o'bannon's character's video diaries where he reveals that he's not actually pinned back and he's just got a variety of like very bad haircuts. And I just love that whole, and they never comment on that subplot, but all of a sudden for the the next, cause that's like halfway through the movie and for the rest of the movie, you realize this guy is not even who he says he is and nobody gives a shit because (laughs) that's how meaningless these guys jobs is that nobody even cares that he's not. Yeah. Cause he's not the actual dude. I I forgot about that, (laughs) but yeah, like part of the way through, he's just kind of like, uh, I'm actually a fuel engineer or something like yeah. that and i'm here <laughs> pinback's underwear does not fit appropriately <laughs> it's like it's, it's, it sags uh he had a bigger dick than i do <laughs> i think uh, uh you know for him for him uh studying psych i i kind of and i feel like some of that some of those skills and some of that insight and some of that education was applied in the script at least a little bit but i kind of would have liked to have seen something a little more fleshed out in turn i mean they dealt with the characters in terms of their psyche on the ship but i feel like that could have been explored just a little bit more to get to get folks more engaged with these characters and maybe and maybe that would have not for the folks that do find it too boring and decide to complain about it online maybe that's something that would have given them allow um Maybe that's something that would have allowed them to connect with those characters a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So not long after the film was completed, o- O'Bannon, he starts telling their friends, he's like, I did so much work on this film that it's misleading to call Carpenter the director. It's like, I was as, I'm as responsible for what's on screen as John was. John Carpenter gets word of this. And he already kind of, I think our carpenter already understands the power of like being known as an auteur at this point. Cause after this, every film that John Carpenter ever did says a John Carpenter film on it. Dark star doesn't say that, mm-hmm. but starting with assault on precinct 13, they all say a John Carpenter film. He knows that it's important to have his name above the title. So he hears about this, that O'Bannon's telling people, Hey, I should probably be maybe credited co-director on this. He takes O'Bannon out to a restaurant to set things straight. He told O'Bannon, he's like, I'm the director and no one else. And then he tells him that they needed to stop working together. And O'Bannon was taken aback a little bit by this. He said, here's a quote from O'Bannon regarding that. He says, this really stunned me. John taught me a lot about human nature. People will do terrible things to other people in order to grab all the cookies and run away with it. Up to that point, I had a naive notion that if you're real good friends with someone, you'll be loyal forever. John taught me that it's not true. Some people will cut your head off, run away, and not look back. So him and their their partnership had a pretty acrimonious ending, and they never they never reunited. This isn't like a story where it's like, uh, you know, they they parted ways in a bad way. And then later on, they got back together, you know, like, like we talked about with Toby Hooper and, and Steven Spielberg, you know, mm-hmm. where they kind of got on bad terms because of that whole shit. But then three years later or whatever, Toby Hooper's directing an episode of uh, amazing stories or whatever. So they're never friends again. And, and the two parted ways and, and dark star becomes a calling card for Carpenter because it says directed by John Carpenter on it. And he went on, to continue his career his next thing he does is he he starts writing scripts and he writes the eyes of laura mars which is directed by uh irvin kirshner who directed empire strikes back and then moved on with his own directing career of course with assault on precinct 13 and halloween 
and working with many of the same people that he worked on, worked with on this film. And Carpenter would later say this about Dark Star. Dark Star was one of the most difficult, brutalizing, devastating, and satisfying experiences of my, of my life. It was not successful. It was a weird little science fiction movie with a lot of imagination and energy, but a cardboard spaceship. I wanted it to be slick and professional with suspense and a sense of humor. Instead, it was youthful, naive, and innocent. And he even says on the documentary on that Dark Star Blu-ray that we, we've mentioned a couple of times, which, by the way, he didn't even participate in the documentary they used uh, audio from another interview well neither did dan uh, o'bannon well he was dead <laughs> so <laughs> they used archive footage uh, for him spoiler <laughs> <laughs> but uh he even says yeah it's not it's not my best which it's not it's not his best <laughs> it's not his third best it's he, but he it's, says it like he hasn't potential. even watched it in forever but i mean just from a boy john Let me just say, I mean, the reason I told that story earlier is the guy's already had a run in with what happens when somebody pulls it out from under you when you felt like you've worked hard on something. And so if you are in in that documentary, for instance, like every actor they talk to, every single one says John Carpenter was the director of that movie. This wasn't a Toby Hooper situation. This is like not even like dispute. Everybody was like, yeah, Dan was hands on, but every cast member says John Carpenter sat in the director's role that there, he was, he was a good listener. He was a collaborator. I saw, but when a question arose, we had a decision to make, we didn't have to go to executives. You went to John Carpenter. He was in charge of this movie. And yeah, so- I mean, I, like I, I said this before, I think John Carpenter deserves a directing credit on this, but as far as the, the definition of an auteur comes up, you know, John Carpenter is not the the singular author of this movie. I, I've got a lot of thoughts about the whole auteur theory anyway, because as we've we've discussed before, especially last week on our Poltergeist episode, film is a very collaborative medium, right? And there are very few filmmakers that deserve the auteur title. Uh, I think John Carpenter does on some movies. I think on this movie, his co-author is Dan O'Bannon. John Carpenter directed it. But O'Bannon co-created it. I'm just trying to get inside of what hit, what was may have been going on in his head, and I think that that was that he's he already seen, the, he, he the rug pulled the, out from under him before with his short film. But he wants to be credited. He wants people yes. to acknowledge that he because is because he wants this to lead to the next thing. And and for him, he even tells a story that you know he remembers being at lunch with Dan O'Bannon just sitting there. They couldn't get work. It wasn't like Eyes of Laura Mar- Mars fell into his lap. It was that they were sitting there, and he said he couldn't get work afterwards. They he well, Jack having, Harris helped. Yeah, he had to go to Jack Harris to yeah. get help. He had to go back and play that game again because yeah. he 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 which says O'Bannon he was sitting, not willing to do. Yeah, and which O'Bannon was not willing to do. And uh, Carpenter says he remembers sitting at lunch with with O'Bannon, being like, "We're not hot shit, man." Like we thought we were, and we were coming out of this, and we thought we would be. But we thought everyone would be knocking our door down. Yeah, and they're not. It didn't happen that way. And so he, yeah, Carpenter went out and found that Eyes of Laura Mars book, I guess it was, and he got a screenplay together and brought it to Harris, and Harris thought it was all right. It said somebody, I forget, whoever was the producer on it, I'm sure one day we'll talk about it, happened to stop in his office and see it. And it was just like a luck of the draw thing. Like he was like, what is this? And he read it and was like, well, I want this. And so Harris having the relationship he did with Carpenter was like, yeah, take it. But, you know, make sure you include John Carpenter in this. And that, that led on to the other stuff. But, uh, you know, for Carpenter, it was, it was still like he, he, he wanted credit, I think. And I, I had this quote here from him about Dan O'Bannon And he says, we had an intense relationship. And the last thing you want as a director is another guy who wants to be the director. Dan is talented. He's terrific, but I don't want to work with him. I'm giving up something. I'm giving up Dan's imagination. He's a tremendous actor. He's a tremendous writer. He's an idea guy, but better to be on my own, better to make it or fail on my own rather than have a symbiotic relationship with somebody who only wants to undo me as a director. So we said goodbye. I mean, that's, it's kind of a bummer, but I I also think that I think O'Bannon and Carpenter, it would have been cool to see 
what, what else other they could have done collaborated yeah on. yeah what else they could have done because i think they're both i think john carpenter is an incredible director and i think o'bannon is an incredibly imaginative guy which is why we're doing this whole series on him because well, I, like, feel, I feel like we just said he is an idea man. Man. yeah i feel like we just play plaintiff and defend it with it but i mean really what it what it boils down to for me is like i'm looking at them and i'm like these are just two headstrong people that yeah which doesn't always work you yeah. know uh, I do think that they both sell the movie short a little bit. Uh, that, I mean, obviously they would go on to be, do bigger and better things. And maybe in retrospect, looking back, they're like, yeah, Dark Star wasn't great. Well, it was your first thing. Your first thing's never your best thing, right? <laughs> right? Usually. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you'd you imagine, I mean, I guess. Especially them, while you're still must, learning. Yeah, it must feel like that, though. Like if somebody brought up your high school writing project or something. And they're like, this is what this guy can do. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, ah, yeah. oh, shit. Well, wait, <laughs> like, it's not like a band who gets, who who's playing together for five years before making their first album. Like, yeah. Okay. That's their first right. album. And it's a, it's a masterpiece. Well, they've been playing together for five years. The movies aren't the same way. It's like, yeah, they may, may have made some short films, but this is their first real thing. They're still in the learning process. Right. And I, I think Dark Star is remarkably innovative and ambitious for what started out as a student project. I think that it, I think that it, I think the limitations, I think it makes those limitations work in its favor. You know, like the, like the little helmets, you know, which are just toy helmets. You know, we talked about the innovation of, of being able to get the actor to actually breathe in, in that helmet and not fog it up. Like that's super clever, but also, it works in the favor of the film narratively because it looks very uncomfortable. Mm. Like wearing that helmet looks very uncomfortable. And that was kind of their whole thing with this movie, making space travel look uncomfortable. Like it is an uncomfortable thing. That's why they're crammed into that little cockpit where one person can't get out without, it's like being the guy on the inside of a booth at a restaurant. Like, Oh, I got to get out and use the bathroom. And the other two people have to move, you know, Uh, it's, it's, they're trying to make space look uncomfortable. So using a little toy helmet that's literally too small for the guy's head because it's made for a child works in that case. Yeah. Or in that like hyperdrive sequence that we mentioned earlier, like that's just O'Bannon f- figuring something out. Like, how do I do this? Let's figure it out and make it look cool. He wasn't imitating something he'd seen before. He was just, he just pulled that from his brain. And that was something that had never been done before. That is now like just general shorthand for hyperdrive or warp drive in science fiction movies. Yeah. And that's just something that they had to figure out because they didn't have any other way to do it. Like, I love that. If for nothing else, I mean, I'm not sure that I would, you know, say dark stars, like in the top two or three of either one of these guys movies. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely fascinating just uh, to see like the, the early stages of, well, genius. Like, I mean, just these guys mm-hmm. and like what was going to come from, from, from all of them and just just the collaborative effort i mean i i would even say like just what everybody put into this thing you're talking about film being collaborative but i mean but but yeah just i mean from the score to the shots that are in it just to the uh thinking outside the box to get it done i mean that's that's some cool stuff man when you know the story behind it and then what these guys are going to go off to to do i mean even so far as to say like like you talked about earlier the alien being a precursor to michael myers i mean it's just uh it's just interesting to see like the early stages of of what these guys have hollywood you know they they didn't really you know, john carpenter got his chance he eventually you know they, they weren't knocking down their doors but he eventually got work writing the eyes of lord mars and which would lead into him doing assault on precinct 13 but they weren't paying much attention to dan o'bannon in the wake of Dark Star's release, but but then there would be one guy who would seek O'Bannon out, somebody far outside of Hollywood, which was an experimental director by the name of Alejandro Jodorowsky. Uh, he was looking to film an adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune, and he had been he had seen Dark Star, and he had been so impressed by the special effects that he wanted O'Bannon to do the special effects for his new film, and. It seemed like this was going to be like O'Bannon's big break. You know, he, as we know, that that version of Dune never happened. It's one of the great unmade films of all time. And when it fell apart, it nearly ruined Dan O'Bannon. If you want a really good look at this story, there's a movie called Jodorowsky's Dune 
full length documentary that's all about this. It talks a lot about O'Bannon's involvement in this, and it's a fascinating look at what would have been one of the wildest movies to ever exist. And you also watch that documentary documentary and you're like, yeah, I get why nobody wanted to film, film this. It's insane. <laughs> the Jodorowsky's idea was that he would find the most talented visual artists in the world, put them in a room together and let the best ideas win. So he signed up Salvador Dali who didn't come in person. He would just submitted things. Cause you know, he, he cause he's Salvador Dali, <laughs> right. uh, French artist Mobius, <laughs> who is so. a very well-known French uh, comic book artist, British illustrator, Chris Foss, also very well-known Swiss surrealist artist, H.R. Giger, and then Ron Cobb and Dan O'Bannon. So there'd be dicks in it, though. With Giger, there'd be, there'd be some dicks in it. Oh, there definitely would be, yes. Yeah. And in <laughs> fact, it's it's wild because you watch... We'll, we'll probably get into this more next week, but there's some concept art that, that Giger did for this movie, for Dune, that would later show up in... You know, I, We all know Giger ends up doing Alien, but there's some specific imagery that shows up in like Prometheus, like late, like that Ridley Scott referenced way on down the line. It's kind of wild to, to see. Interesting. But O'Bannon loved this idea of getting all a bunch of artists in a room. Like this is where this movie's starting from because it's starting as art and design, not with a bunch of producers and suits and guys just looking for something to sell guys like Jack Harris. Uh, so he he gets to live, he gets brought out to Paris. He gets to live in Paris for months. He's treated like a VIP. But the the Dune production would eventually collapse due to money issues. Uh, no, nobody wanted to fund it. Hollywood was understandably wary about financing a film with Jodorowsky as a director. Uh, and if you've seen any Jodorowsky films, you might understand that, but especially one with the budget that this one would have required. And the collapse of the film that meant that O'Bannon was sent back to Los Angeles. But here's the thing. All of his shit was in Paris. Uh, he, he So what happens is Dune shuts down. He actually had traveled to Los Angeles. He wasn't actually sent back to Los Angeles. He had traveled to Los Angeles to do something for the film and was going to go back to Paris where all of his stuff was. Like literally everything he owned was in Paris. And while he's in, in Los Angeles, the film shuts down and he doesn't have a home in Los Angeles. He's staying on what would the, the couch of who the woman who would end up being his wife he's staying on her couch, but all of his belongings, everything he owns is in Paris. He, he didn't have a, uh, he wasn't renting an apartment because he knew he was living in Paris for months. Well, when the production shuts down, he no longer has a place in Paris, even though all his stuff is there. He doesn't have a home in Los Angeles. So he is now broke and homeless essentially. Ugh. And he's it forced him to, to, depend on friends to survive. So he goes like he's couch surfing essentially. And one of the friends that he ends up staying at their house for a while is a guy named Ron Shusett. So while O'Bannon is staying at Shusett's house, sleeping on his couch, the two began to discuss collaborating on a new movie project. Shusett is also a writer. They ended up revisiting a previous script that O'Bannon had been working on. So kind of an idea that he had had that kind of spawned from some stuff that he had done on Dark Star. And the script, that script would eventually turn into a film that we all know as Alien. Deep Throat. Oh, Alien. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we're going next week, guys. We're going to Alien next week. Uh, obviously, a much more well-known film probably than Dark Star, but another one that O'Bannon you know, was integral in, in getting to the big screen and probably the most well-known of any film that he was directly involved in. So that's going to be the story we're telling next week. For yeah, part two of our Dan O'Bannon series. It's gonna be interesting. There's a, it's gonna to be it. a short episode though. There's not a lot to say about Alien, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of information. <laughs> not a lot of information out there about that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's it, guys. That's part one of our Dan O'Bannon series. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Nice. Uh, I like. I'm glad that you guys seem to enjoy the film. I, I don't know if you, either of you had ever seen it. I don't think I, Todd no, has. No, that was know. a Dark Star. That it, was a first view for me. There's a few cool. John Carpenters that I haven't seen that I've just saved for like a rainy day. That like one day I'm like, let's see this thing John Carpenter did. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to a John Carpenter career overview down the line, I'm sure, because there's so much to say about him. And well, we uh, won't have to we, talk about Dark Star, will we? No, we won't. We've covered it. And next week we're covering. Our first Ridley Scott movie as well. So, oh, look at that. 
Well, do you guys want to let our audience know where you can be found on the internet? Um, I am at, this is Gary Horn on all the social medias. I do a wrestling podcast. It's at TIPW show. You can find it. It's called, this is pro wrestling. Oh, also, it's also on the official NWA YouTube channel. I now, was about Gary. to say, we're now officially moved to the end <laughs> official NWA channel for a show called, this is the NWA. And it's going to be yeah. available on Tuesdays at seven Oh five. You can watch that. If you want to NWA power is on fight TV. So you can watch. So that. your you boss is Billy Corgan show. now. Technically, I my boss is Billy Corgan now. Yes, not even technically. No, technically, nice. I just had to write him a complete synopsis and send it to him on uh, what I expected the show to be, so that he had confidence That's, that it would be. Life is okay. weird. Life is weird. <laughs> life is <Yeah>. weird. <laughs> You're the lead singer of your favorite band growing up is now your. There's boss. like yeah, I know it's crazy. One there's, of your there's like layers <laughs> of of getting to him. Like I don't just like go to him with my problems, but uh, he is he is he's, the, over- he's at the top. He's at the he's top. At the top. The- he's overseeing it. Yes, nice, That's crazy. Todd, how about you, man? Uh, I am at Mr. Todd A. Davis on all the socials, and I have a podcast as well called Computer Resume Podcast. It's all about yeah, and Star you're, Trek. You're- your boss is Gene Roddenberry. Oh, uh, well, I was going to actually, my <laughs> boss is Neelix. Damn it. <laughs> your, your boss is the uh, corpse of Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh, oh, man. But yeah, we're, we're covering the entire Star Trek franchise in chronological order. And uh, both Gary and Justin have appeared and will appear again uh, if they, if they, if they will. <laughs> Uh, right now we're in the middle of Star Trek Enterprise and that's a bit of a that's a bit of a chore to watch but we're having fun and I think we've got some some good episodes are really right around the corner so I'm looking I did enjoy the meme you posted the other day about how to defeat COVID and you play the uh, theme from Enterprise over and over again until it kills itself (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's that's not far off from the truth guys (laughs) (laughs) I'm at Justin underscore Bishop and you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and all that stuff. The show, most importantly, is at cinema underscore shock, or you can find us at cinemashock.net. Like us on Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff, and rate and review. Send us to your friends. You got a friends who are fans of Alien or Return of the Living Dead or John Carpenter or, or any of the other stuff that we're talking about on this Dan O'Bannon series. Uh, send them this episode. Let them know where Dan O'Bannon's story began. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you for your input gary all right until yeah. next week may the wings of liberty never lose a feather that's from a john carpenter movie it is be excellent to each other not from a john carpenter movie although i would watch john carpenter's version of that <laughs> johnny has the keys and he took them to space beach <laughs> what i don't that's I where don't all the that's where all the bikini clad women uh God damn dark star we're like how they're we're like spa- they're on space 25 beach. episodes into this podcast or something now right like 30 episodes in mm-hmm. it's just in, it's just part of it now can we just come up with like a catchphrase that's like motivational to people well i'll see what i can do it's hard to argue when your wife bought my t-shirt <laughs> i'll burn it <laughs> your wife's <laughs> Uh, All right, I gotta go get COVID vaccine. All right, go get it, Gary. Good luck with the microchip. Thanks. (laughs) 